Good morning and welcome everyone. This is John. I hope everyone had a delightful, restful three-day weekend. I'll tell you right now, I think everybody took this weekend off in one way or another because I thought my email server was broken. I had no real emails. I, my spam box is almost empty. It seems like even the spammers took a vacation. Um, not joking, I'm serious. So if you feel the same way, uh, just tap us a yes or uh, maybe I should uh, Facebook that or tweet that out and maybe you could like it. But uh, in the meantime, um, take a, a, just a quick review. Uh, today we do not have uh, a weekly outlook yet. It'll be uh, provided this afternoon. And um, the majority of the markets that are open right now that we traded over the weekend, gold is down uh, $20. We have uh, the bond market down and the stock market uh, traded up to test those 2000 and uh, a new high in the S&P. So what we're looking at here in when we come in every day for planning and scanning or every Monday for planning and scanning, the first thing we start off with is let's look at the way the market traded and, and what does it look like from a breadth and market perspective. More importantly, I will say today uh, and this week even, while we had a very, very light volume week last week, prices rose, but we saw strong breadth and that means that a lot of the move that we saw last week came on the heels of an accumulation of stocks within each respected index. Now, I want to take a look at each one individually and give you a look-see as to what we possibly can um, expect. We have unemployment out, the monthly unemployment out this week. Today uh, is without a, a doubt we have a, one of probably the most important of the three economic numbers coming out this week. Today the ISM, the Institute of Supply Management and Construction Spending. Those two numbers come out at 10 a.m. Eastern. Those will be very important numbers. Wednesday, tomorrow, we have the Eurozone GDP and the Eurozone retail sales out. Now, again, I will have out our weekly observations out for you this morning sometime, but I wanted to go through why is it important to look at the Euro GDP and retail sales? And there's a lot of talk of, of course, quantitative easing uh, in Europe with uh, um, the Euro uh, head of uh, uh, in charge, Drahi, as most people have been hearing the, the headline news, will be looking at some type of a boost to the, um, and most people feel that he is going to do some form of quantitative easing, and that's what the euro currency is, is pricing in as we see a stronger dollar versus the euro. The euro is going down. The um, retail sales and GDP number at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning will be significant. In addition to that, tomorrow morning, Wednesday, the ADP, excuse me, Wednesday morning, Wednesday morning, uh, Prince Spaghetti Day is Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, if you remember that old commercial, ADP employment comes out at 8.15. Now, that's a private uh, payroll company. In fact, you can trade that stock, and the symbol is ADP. Uh, their numbers come out at 8.15 Wednesday. Factory orders at 10 a.m., not all that important. But I will say that, without a doubt, the Beige Book Report, which comes out Wednesday at 2 p.m., that is the second biggest report that comes out. And, of course, the third biggest report will be the unemployment monthly figures that come out. Um, and the components that we want to watch for, of course, is what the job rate participation levels are, as well as what the hourly work week was. We want to see, did they increase jobs and did they increase the ones that were hired? Did they increase the amount of hours uh, they were allowed to work? And average wages, so were they working on overtime? And that will be significant because that reflects a potential build in employment cost inflation. Um, inflationary wage cost pressures, that's what the key is we want to focus in on, wage cost inflation. We know that gas prices have come back a bit, but they're nowhere near a dollar a gallon. We know food is awful expensive. Um, in fact, leather goods are off the charts because of the uh, way beef prices and cattle have uh, been rising substantially. So these are some of the elements that we want to look at in that um, employment report. When I take a look at the overall market, we noted that last week, really we did see an increase in the market 
in value in the S&Ps, but the uh, uh, diminished range open closed relationship and on that light volume, as you can see with the on balance volume, that is to be determined to see if we pick that up this week. But as far as the ad, uh, advanced decline analysis, you can clearly see that we did break out to newer highs on a daily basis in the S&P 500. So what did we look like on the NASDAQ? The NASDAQ as well did break out, but we made a substantial breakout in price. Unfortunately, it wasn't as a significant rise in the NASDAQ and uh, of course volume was, was uh, uh, muted as well. We'll get back to the NASDAQ in just a minute. The Russell is actually the one that has a little bit uh, of perplexity on the, between the two different time frames. Perplexity meaning we take a look at this daily, note that we did not make newer highs, and everyone clearly can see we have not made newer highs. The Russell's been lagging, and clearly we can see with the advanced decline, it's actually been almost moving in sync with its price. And the one area that is not moving in sync with price is volume. Volume is lagging significantly uh, beyond the, w behind this move. Now, what can happen here, and this is what I'm looking at, what can happen is if the, typically we see the Russell at times outperform the benchmark markets during the month of mid-August through the first week of October. So with that said, perhaps we could see a rotation that comes out of some money, out of some sectors of the market, and rotates into the Russell. So we want to pay attention to the Russell, and over the next two days before these reports come out, I want to see if we make and sustain newer highs and see a pop on the AD lines. I will tweet that out. That would confirm that we are seeing a sector rotation. Where do I think the money is going to come out of? I think the money is going to come out of the high-flying tech and also biotech, which XCI, the Computer Hardware Technology Index, and the biotech, the IBB, both seem to have peaks on or about the middle to the first, the end of the first week of September on average. So with that said, perhaps those two sectors which have seen significant gains over the summer, um, those are the sectors that people might take some money off the table and we could see money pouring into or at least support in the small caps. We want to watch that relationship. In addition, looking at the NYSE, the NYSE is, I teach everybody, uh, not to be the sole loan uh, advanced decline indicator if you're looking at breadth because the uh, NYSE contains mostly or over 50 percent that's not mostly, but over 50%, it has interest rate sensitive preferred stocks as well as bond funds into it. We noted that bonds were also rallying in sync with uh, the equity markets. And in, when, when I take a look at this and I go, well, this is a one loan uh, index that hasn't, besides the Dow, broken out, but quite frankly, it broke out with its advanced decline and it did so last week. So the NYSE did break out. And uh, the interesting aspect, it broke out with a little stronger volume than the rest of the, the, the markets. And so that might have had something to do with the fact that bond prices went up and there was a lot of activity going into preferred and bond pricing. So when we walk in today and we note that the bond market is down, gold is down, um, this could affect the NYSE. Now this is where it gets kind of tricky. When we take a look at blue chip stocks, and we look at the Dow, we go, wow, what's wrong with the diamonds here? And uh, when we move forward, we say, well, um, the diamonds, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it did make a significant higher high, or insignificant higher high, excuse me, in price. It made a significant higher high in the advanced decline. And it also came with, again, very light volume. So what we want to watch for is by Wednesday's close. That gives us two business days to see if the price maintains this high level. If the advanced decline maintains this high level, we want to see if the volume over the next two days, this will be a key, if the volume actually picks up over the next two days. So price could stay the same. Advanced decline can stay the same. Let's watch to see if the volume catches up and more people are following into this uh, or, or buying into this rally. And that will give us an idea that, yes, we could see some more further upside. And I'm thinking maybe one, one and a half, maybe three uh, percent in the upside of the market. 
I think that when we do look at advanced decline, we don't just like to take a look at the dailies. We like to compare the dailies with the weekly to give us a clearer picture. And how does the weekly look? One thing we did last week was we spent a little bit of time as the market was giving uh, some, some okay day trade setups. What we were doing was we were spending some time in, and going back and seeing what the, what the advanced decline looks like when everyone goes long a market. And is it reliable at predicting tops? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because at times, if the advanced decline gets too strong, it resembles almost the theory that if everyone's long, what else is going to take this market up? I think that the, the other aspect is if there's no volume behind the market, then all it takes is just a little bit of air and we can see the market plunge. So the S&Ps on a week-to-week -week revolving basis, a cumulative basis, did not see a significant increase in the advanced decline. And so we need to be on guard. I want to jump ahead because it is truly the same story with all the other markets um, that we saw here. I want to go over and look at another different uh, methodology of analyzing the breadth, and that is one that we use with the McClellan Oscillator. And the thing with the McClellan Oscillator, we again like to look at two different time frames, daily as well as weekly. Because remember, weekly, if it's a cumulative total, it counts all the advances and declines from Friday to Friday and doesn't take an account of the intra-week moves. So with that said, I think it's important to take a look at the, uh, both the daily as well as the weekly. So when we take a look at the weekly, we note that while we did see an overbought reading and the market came, gave us a zero line, and we have noted that one strange anomaly is on a weekly basis, we are seeing, and I'm sure everyone, if I highlight this, we are seeing the advanced decline, which is very strange, making lower highs and lower lows. So I look at that and I say, well, that's, that's an interesting, since the weeklies look strong individually, the McClellan Oscillator, which takes a um, 19 versus 39 day uh, moving average, and if this, if this McClellan Oscillator continues to form divergence meaning price is making higher highs and the McClellan oscillator is making lower highs over time, then this is a warning shot that we still could see short-term strength in the market. And that is the theory that I'm working on. We could see a little short-term strength in the market, but longer term, I think it's, it bodes for however much this market has left in it to the upside, it may be signaling that we, we need to have some longer term cautionary view of the market. Longer term to me is the next 90 days. Already looking at the short term, um, we are clinging to the outer band of the daily. Now I switch from weekly to daily and I look at the outer band and I go, wow, this is actually considered a McClellan oscillator due to a pattern as well as location, a leading indicator based on the premise that when we see moves that get to these outer band readings, typically it signals potential market tops. And so looking at that and then combining the percentage change, if we get this back into focus, basically what we are looking at the upper top is one thing we go through almost every single week. It is the relationship sp or spread chart differential between the S&Ps and the NASDAQ 100. And the funny thing is, is that when we line up potential turns, now remember, the McClellan oscillator can be a little early. So we can see the fact that this market, when it gets to these high readings, we get declines. When we get to these high readings, excessive high readings, we come into declines in the market. When we get to these excessive high readings, and I'm repeating myself as I share with you, we get declines in the market. So we have areas that we say as a McClellan oscillator reading, if we are getting to overbought territory and a lot of these extreme peak readings do give us, um, in the past, they have given us good heads up that while the market may go up a little bit higher, it has given us leading indications that we have seen corrections or downturns in the market. So with that said, at extreme readings, almost all these major peaks, we have seen a little bit, and sometimes it's a little early, but we see those corrections in the marketplace. And now we're back up to 
an extreme reading. So this time is one that I have to say um, we haven't really changed or I haven't really changed my opinion in the sense that I think over the next 60 to 90 days we have something that could possibly change and the only events that I have that could say what could it be the unseen uh, corrective nature is first off the warning signs that we want to look at is when we get a spread differential of uh, a magnitude of this wide between the S&P and the NASDAQ first off that's a a little bit of a warning sign number one number two the McClellan oscillator that high reading so while individually as I mentioned with the advanced decline when it gets too strong it almost indicates that everyone's boat loaded into the marketplace and we want to be uh, cautious and the McClellan oscillator both daily and weekly are certainly confirming that um, it's just a different way of looking at the numbers in addition, the spread chart, as you can see here, has clearly, as the markets are making newer highs, you can see that the spread chart isn't. So it's showing some market internal weakness here that we need to pay attention to. So with that said, I don't want anyone to walk away with uh, this week saying, well, you know, everyone's calling for a top and half the people call for a top and half the people say this market's great. Which is it? I think that the market on light volume can do whatever it wants, but in the end, what we really want to focus in on is, is the rally sustainable? So is this a time to be adding to longs or maybe taking a portion of profits for those that are heavily long the stock market um, in certain areas that are a little rich? And for that, to determine that, the first thing we do is we look at our relative strength comparative analysis. And what is relatively rich compared to the rest of the market? And there's two things that we have. IBB is biotech, uh, number one. Number two is still the semiconductors. Um, those two sectors are relatively rich compared to, let's say, the KIE, regional banks, which is still negative on the year, and home builders, which is the ITB, negative. In fact, looking at the XRT as well as consumer discretionary, those are two laggards, which if consumer spending definitely adds to GDP, gross domestic product, if it's consumer spending that gets things uh, moving. Obviously, they're not buying homes. Home builders aren't doing as well. And they're not spending in the retail stores as one would expect. So that means everyone is buying and investing in biotech and anyone's investing in semiconductors. And that, that, that formula to have a broad-based rally needs to kind of change. The wealth needs to be spread around, so to speak. So if these sectors um, these are the two that we want to kind of focus in on over the next couple of days because as we did an, an event last uh, week, we shared the fact that these two sectors actually do end a seasonally strong period of time. So I do want to say, hey, I know we've had a, a, a much needed rest in the market either because of just the constant grind of where's the market going and what do we invest in. And, 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 and it, you know what? You need to take a rest and step back and say, all right, where are we going with this market? If the world's global economies and if the world's global stock markets, if every country still needs to implement quantitative easing to boost and have a zero interest rate policy, then the stock market at one point needs to say, well, this is great news. We're either really profiting on our own or it's artificially um, provided by a low interest rate environment and things eventually will change. Is it immediate? Is it this week? Well, we do have the Beige Book out Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m., and that's going to be important. But more, I think, most importantly, we want to see what's the retail sales doing in Europe, because if they're not spending money in Europe, remember, a lot of our blue chip companies, even Apple, uh, IBM, Starbucks, a lot of companies have business abroad, and if they're not doing well in sales abroad, um, it will hurt their bottom line. So needless to say, the message that I have is still a cautionary stance while we still can see, and I think it's important to look at the next two days uh, from a technical perspective rather than saying, oh, uh, you know, I, I've been on vacation for the last three days and I forgot all about the market. I don't think that's the, um, I don't think that's really what people are doing as much as, hey, let's give this market a couple days to see what happens. When I look at the knob spread, that's notes over bond, last week we made a new higher high. The spread widened. 
In fact, we saw, as you can see here, um, this needs to be labeled, but this is the 10-year notes, and this is the 30-year bonds. The long end of the yield curve, people have been actually selling or not buying the 10 years, which is the mid-yield curve, it's considered. The 10 years have gone flat. The 30-year bonds have gone up. In the meantime, look at stock prices. They've gone up. So one or two things, this is a very perplexing situation. One or two things are going to happen. have to happen. If the stock market is still going to continue to move up, then we would probably see a change as well in A, the 10 years to move lower, and B, to see the bond prices move lower. And if that's the case, this knob spread should continue or at least reverse rather than continue to move up. So I want to watch A, the longer term notes over bonds relationship because if the stock market is stronger, remember, people will come out of treasuries and start to look at the spread differential to the long end in corporate treasury debt. Because if the economy is doing well and the stock market and the underlying notion that stocks are doing well, then the corporate debt that uh, a lot of companies issue, that should be a very healthy and safe investment. But we don't see that, and I don't see that in the market right now. So let's focus in the next two days to watch to see if there's follow through in the volume or to see if the rally that we saw over this three-day weekend is sustainable in the equity markets. As far as any uh, new stock trades, I would go over and take a look at our scans real quick, which really is a part of, of uh, planning and scanning is to take an overview of the market, number one, to say if the market is susceptible for a pullback eventually, and how strong would that pullback be? If whatever went up on light volume can come down and, and can come down on heavier volume, it could get pretty ugly pretty quickly. But when I take a look at different companies, I go, well, let's see what sectors um, can or have maybe presented themselves with uh, a lack of interest. And one area of interest is oil and gas drilling. And this is a company, RDC, Rowan and Companies. It's come across my radar many times uh, this season. The funny thing is, is last week, RDC generated a weekly high closed doji and on really strong volume. If everyone can see this on balance volume reading, um, a very strong on balance volume reading, high closed doji, um, and the stock price hasn't gone anywhere. So one thing I would strongly recommend for anyone, if we are seeing a, a switch over, is I think that there are still some bargain stocks. Um, a, number one, you can look at buying a company like Rowan in this space um, based on that uh, surge in on balance volume in the short term, the high closed doji. But more importantly, what happens since we do not have a weekly buy signal not present? Um, but the market closed above past or prior highs. It closed above both moving averages. Another way to look at it is to see if this stock gets above 30.54, and that would be on a closing basis for the end of this week. If you get above 30.54, it's above that last conditional change. I see a lot of upside left in this market, and at least to test the six-month highs. Looking at the market on a daily performance basis, I go, well, something's wrong here. The weekly looked very strong, and the daily didn't really do anything because the daily you know, was on very light volume. So again, this is one that I think we want to watch for a weekly close above that level A, and B, let's look maybe the next two days because this is an exact point I wanted to make. A lot of stocks went up on air. Let's see how they respect, not just today, but also let's see how they respect Wednesday. Today, a lot of people are still struggling their heads, getting back into work, and they have to readjust themselves. Um, as far as economic numbers today, with construction spending and ISM at 10 a.m., and, and then I think that's when people are going to kind of say, okay, let's, let's get our solid footing here into the market, and let's see how the market really respects tomorrow's beige book. Would it be too late to get in on any stocks on the long side? Well, a company like RDC, I would have to say, considering the fact that it is at its or near, as you can see here, as I'm going to get this up into um, 
focus for you. As you can see, it's a lot closer to its 52-week lows than it is its 52-week highs. So there are some other names as we went through and wanted to see not just um, how many stocks gave us not PPS buy or PPS sell signals, but how many stocks gave us weekly high close or low close doji formations. And that's one I wanted to put a list together and say, okay, here is some high close and low close dojis and uh, look at it from a weekly basis. On a weekly stock, we had exactly 22 symbols that generated high close dojis. Um, there wasn't any one. Chevron was another one. Direct TV, Consolidated Ed is a utility company. Uh, there wasn't any one name that stood out. McDonald's, which had poor performance. Uh, you know, from a, a, a relative strength perspective, this is one that I'd say the quality of the high closed OG in these names weren't all that great. But Rowan and Companies, which obviously formed on our, our, our screen, as well as Spectra Energy, again, it's in this oil and gas storage as well as the oil and gas exploration. That sector seemed to be um, more than one name popped up. So the good news is, is when I start to see more than one name pop up in that space, I have gathered a strong interest. When I look at those are the names for the high close doji, what did we get for low close dojis on a weekly basis? The funny thing is, we only got six names. Agilent Technologies. Um, Agilent Technologies, you know, it's a name that if it is in a space that is going to, and it generated a weekly sell signal, um, Agilent Technology, Life Sciences Tools, it's in the, I guess, the category of uh, biotech. I want to watch a little bit more than just one name in a strong sector to see if it caves. Now, CBS Corporation, again, it's, it's all by itself. Motorola, it's all by itself. Motorola hasn't participated in this rally whatsoever. And so a market that is, cannot maintain any strength going with the market trend, obviously there's some bigger problems they have. Paychecks. Well, that's interesting because um, when I look at this particular name and I go, wow, the um, on-balance volume on a daily basis is a lot weaker than price. And when I take a look at a, a short-term time frame and I draw out a trend or at least I draw out a, a potential chart pattern, I start to imagine that perhaps this is a uh, uh, more indicative of a foghorn or broadening top formation. So I want to pay attention to a that space and its data processing. What comes out this week? Its competitor, ADP. ADP has a different makeup in in the sense that it doesn't have that broadening top, but it does have another uh, strong coincidental factor, it is actually rallied on no volume at all, both daily and weekly. So ADP is, is one that I think uh, in this space we may want to start to uh, watch over the next, again, keyword, two trading days, today and tomorrow by tomorrow's close. So in essence, when we come through and we look at the quality of the signals that we have and the quality of stocks that we have, we note that even Walgreens, the sell signals, the stocks that are weak or the stocks that are bad remain bad. And the stocks that have been good remain good. But that only lasts for so long, and that's why I think even this week it's something we need to at least watch and pay attention to in the next two days. As far as the markets are concerned, I think people will come back and say, what is going to happen this week is the bond market, which is down uh, one basis, one full point and four basis, um, is the bond market. This is one that I think longer term, which we do have T, uh, a, a position in TBT for December 5860 call spread. Um, you know, as TBT, it has actually seen a complete turnaround to the downside and the volume, at least on a weekly basis, started to dry up. Last week we announced on a spread 50% I was buying back the short side of that call spread. And so I'm going to continue to monitor this and look for weekly buy signals um, because I believe that if the stock market and the bond market, if TBT goes down and the stock market's gone up, that means bond prices have gone up, stock prices have gone up, 
let me show you that in terms of TLT, which is the price related ETF, not yield. TBT is yield, TLT is price. It tracks the actual 30-year bond pricing. Both stocks and bonds have gone up. We also enter, enter in a period where we see that decoupling rather than tandem relationship can occur now. So that's another thing that I think is very critical that we should stay focused on. If the numbers look strong, and if the market is going to concern itself with a potential rise in interest rates or at least a softening of quantitative easing, which is what seems to be happening, here's one of the thought theories. We have the federal government coming back to work and we have an upcoming election. So there could be some not just monetary things that can change or alter the course of the market, but we could has also be uh, looking at some potential fiscal policy changes. So we need to be aware of that. I think the market, we're going to see what the smart money wants to do with this market. We just need to give it two more trading days and to see if the volume picks up into the marketplace. That concludes today's planning and scanning, this week's planning and scanning. And as always, if anything special happens that we need to be aware of, um, by all stretch of the imagination, um, most of you are aware that we send out uh, fairly um, business-like, in, in a joking manner, um, if we go to Person's Planet, and I just wanted to share this with you because, yes, I, I do send some tweets out that are, are more fun in nature, but if you go over here to our, our Twitter logo at the top and just click on that right there, you can sign up for tweet links. Um, every once in a while, um, we send out something funny and um, in any event, or what I think is kind of humorous, um, but more times than not, what we do is we send out actually um, bottom line um, trade ideas, such as we actually had a nice little thing that we talked about with um, looking at crude oil and USO on the 28th and said we got about a 2% potential upside. And then uh, we said, uh, by the way, um, we're looking at uh, crude oil almost hit the profit target. So in any event, we were going to do our special Martingale quarterly option put hedging session. We're going to lay that off for tomorrow and we'll send out that uh, invite because quite frankly, most people, we had a lot of folks send, hey, I'm still out. We have even our own trading community taking vacations this week because they felt that between now and Friday's unemployment report, they just wanted to get that, you know, shake that holiday off. So we're going to spend a little time together as a community doing our, um, and instead of Tuesday, this actually should say Wednesday, but um, you can go and look at some of these tweets that we've put out, and we definitely put a lot of uh, what I think is information that is um, in line with what we talk about in the trading room. So if you're not a part of the, the tweets, you can certainly do them. As you can see, I send mainly tweets that have to do with market conditions. With that said, I want to say thank you, everyone, for being here, and uh, we'll see what happens over the next two days. Thank you, everyone.